So I am really thrilled to be able to follow uh, Barry and, and, uh, and Claire. So I'm here to add some, some biology to, to really remarkably closely tied with the, uh, the kinds of, of concepts that they talked about. We didn't plan this ahead, but, but actually you'll notice I will use many of the same words that, uh, that they do, uh, although I'll be using uh, biological examples. Uh, to me, olfaction is really like a superpower. If you think about what you can do, you can, you can locate and, and identify food and things that you want to eat. You can identify things you don't want to eat. You can identify or, or recognize where you live and who you live with just by sampling the air around those, around those objects, inhaling volatile molecules and processing those and, and recognizing them as food or, 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 or a person really pretty amazing. Um, and at some level, it seems like the olfactory system should be a fairly simple system. So you, you inhale the, the air over this cup of coffee, uh, one could imagine, and you inhale a molecule of coffee, and it goes up your nose and it binds to your coffee receptor, and your cough activation of that receptor tells your brain, uh, I just smelled coffee. Um, unfortunately, that's not the way it works. It's actually far more complicated. Uh, there is no individual coffee molecule, and you do not have a, a receptor for coffee. The, as has already been mentioned, the aroma of coffee is composed of, uh, or the headspace over a cup of coffee is, includes hundreds of different volatile molecules. Uh, maybe only 20 or so of these are important for the actual percept. But, what your brain then has to do is, is recognize that some of these, these molecular features tend to co-occur when I've got a cup of coffee in front of me, and your brain learns that this combination of features uh, is, is uh, associated with this coffee, and, and you may then label it as the aroma of coffee. Okay. So what your brain has to do is, is take these different features and turn them into an object. How, how does that happen? Uh, well, we know a lot about how this happens in the visual system. Um, when you see an object, this is a, a nose. <coughs> so we're good at that. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, so you see that, so, so light reflects off of that object and, and different wavelengths come off of that, of that surface and go into your retina and, and activate cells in your, in your retina and those cells do this am amazing thing called transduction, where they turn light uh, into neural activity. But your retina doesn't really know uh, that you're seeing a nose. What your, what your retina does, what the cells in the retina in the early stages of, of the visual system do, is they pixelate uh, that image in the very similar way that your, that your digital camera pixelates images. And so an individual cell in the, uh, in the retina will, will know that there's a spot of light in a particular location. Okay, and maybe it's a certain wavelength. And a neighboring cell will know whether there's a spot of light there or not. But at the, at the level of the retina, the individual cells in the network doesn't really know what's causing these spots of light. It's just, it's just providing information. There's activity at this pixel, and there's not activity at that pixel. Okay? Now, as the information leaves the retina, and it goes into this massively complicated system uh, called the visual system, I don't know if I Here's the visual system, so here's primary visual cortex here in the back. Now you have cells that are listening to multiple pixels, and they can start extracting features from this, from this pixelated image. And so maybe there's a, maybe there's a cell in, in, in visual cortex that recognizes there's a bunch of pixels here that are all dark, right in a straight, in, in, a, in a line at a certain orientation. And so these cells in visual cortex are saying, there's a line there, okay? There's an edge, there's some sort of a contrast edge. And maybe there's other cells that are recognizing different uh, contrast differences between different parts of this image. And so we start, what the visual system is able to do is now start putting those pixels back together to form an image. And if we follow this process far enough along, we eventually come down here to, to parts of the visual cortex that are sort of right in this area here that can now put all the features together, overlay, uh, uh, the, the wavelength and say, there is this object, there is this nose. Okay, so it's, so it's, a, it's a fractionating system initially, 
It, it breaks the, the, this complex image into pieces and then puts those pieces back together. Um, and, and then actually, if it's, if it's, if it's a running nose, uh, then you have another part of the, of the, of the visual system to deal with, with things like, like motion. Okay. So in vision, then, uh, you have, uh, here's an, an image with lots of different visual features. Uh, and your visual system is able to pick out those different features, uh, but maybe initially this image isn't particularly meaningful to you uh, until you see that some of, these, some of these pixels move coherently. Some of these features move coherently. The visual system learns that these features tend to go together and that they move consistently. And so the visual system very quickly learns that this is an object. These features go together. And, and this is a pattern I can store and next time I see this pattern, I'll be able to, to recognize that as an object. And as was mentioned earlier, that object is distinct from the background now that I've learned it. Okay? If you haven't seen that before, um, uh, I just changed your brain. Uh, and I apologize for that. But <laughs> your, your visual system has just changed and has learned that's an object. So our, our, our brains are phenomenal pattern recognition devices. Um, in, fa in fact, so if, if in this case we can, we can learn there's a pattern here and, and it's distinct from other patterns. Once I've learned that there's a pattern here, there's an object here, half of that object could be missing and I'd be able to fill in the missing pieces. Okay, so it gives me some opportunity for perceptual stability. If it was a temporal pattern, like a, a song or something, I can, I can use that pattern recognition to predict the future. I know this series of notes came, and I know what, ne what notes are going to come next. So pattern recognition is, is really a powerful process that the brain does. On the other hand, sometimes pattern recognition can get out of hand, so we can, we can start, start seeing things that maybe aren't there. We can, see, we can see faces on Mars and faces on toast. Some people see this as presidential. So you can, you can really start to, to see patterns that, that, that may or may not be there. The olfactory system seems to do something very similar. It may use slightly, it may use actually fairly dramatically different circuits, but it seems to work on the same level. So as I, as I inhale uh, uh, this cup of coffee again, again, there's, there's a variety of different volatile molecules, and as we, we've already heard, those molecules, in this case orthonasal olfaction, go in and bind to these receptors in your olfactory receptor sheet. And then those sensory neurons project right into your forebrain, uh, which is, again, something to think about uh, given the things you might put up your nose. Uh, this is a direct route right into, right into your forebrain uh, uh, to a structure called the olfactory bulb. And without going into too much detail, this amazing uh, 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 system translates what, as we've already heard, is not really a spatial phenomenon into uh, a, a, a representation that has a spatial component. So you have these receptors in your nose, these cells uh, expressing different receptors. You ha humans have about 400 different types of receptors uh, we'd, um, that are binding to different types of, of molecular features. And those sensory neurons project into the olfactory bulb, this, this strip here at the, at the base of your brain, and target these little structures called glomeruli. It's not important that you remember that name. But what it does is this structure here, which are the connections coming from the nose, uh, you have uh, thousands of these little structures. This activity in this structure means, if there's activity in this structure, it means that there was something that bound, bound to the receptors that go to that structure. Okay? And these glomeruli, uh, these, structure, these, these little circles, are, are scattered over the surface of the olfactory bulb. So when I inhale an odor, this is just a monomolecular odor, smells sort of uh, floral a little bit. I activate many different receptors, and then I get, this is activity in the brain. Each of these little spots are some of these glomeruli that are being activated. So I, I create, your olfactory bulb creates this spatial pattern that represents some of the features that you just inhaled. Okay? And so if I inhale, again, most odors are complex mixtures. If I inhale coffee, now this is, this is a, another view of this a way to view these different glomeruli, these different uh, areas that are activated in response to, this is now smelling coffee, and I'm looking down on my olfactory bulb, I see all these little spots, these little glomeruli that are activated. If we, if we take that coffee and analyze all the different molecular components in coffee, then you can see, okay, this, this component of coffee, whatever molecule this is, it makes that spot light up, which is right there. And this component of coffee makes that spot light up, which is right there. 
And so really what this olfactory system, this uh, peripheral parts of the olfactory system are doing is breaking this stuff you just sucked up your nose into features and creating these, these patterns uh, of activity. So who reads the patterns? Oh, I should just mention, <coughs> as I noted, um, we have about 400 different um, uh, olfactory receptors. There's a lot of variability between different people. And so your receptors may not exactly match mine. So there can be a fair bit of, of, of variability between individuals in, in how they perceive different odors. In the in extreme case, some people may not be able to smell uh, some odors. So who's reading the patterns? We, 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 we suck up the molecules from the coffee. They go to this structure called the olfactory bulb and create these spatial and, 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 and different patterns. And then it mo the information moves on to the olfactory cortex, sort of like what we were talking about with the visual system. We can draw these circuits of, of olfactory system. And, it, and it's the olfactory cortex down, down in here. It's a very old type of cortex. It's sort of at the base of your brain. Uh, these, the, these pieces of olfactory cortex are doing what are reading the patterns that your olfactory system created by, by uh, identifying the features of what you just inhaled. And it's that reading of the patterns and learning that some features co-occur co that allows you, we think, to recognize that aroma as, as coffee in the future. Learning, and you're, you're very lucky that this is true, um, learning that uh, about, about, about odors and, and learning that some features go together and some feature, features don't, again, changes your brain in, in very much the same way as the, as the dog that you just saw. Uh, it doesn't take very long for you to learn a new odor and that changes the representation and, and, and then makes it easier for your brain to recognize that odor in the future and to discriminate it uh, from, from um, other similar odors. So depending on the kind of experience you've had, um, uh, that will influence how your uh, olfactory system uh, works. So what's the advantage? It seems like it would be really simple. Let's have, let's have a coffee receptor, and when I smell coffee, um, that receptor gets activated, and I know what it is. Why go to all the trouble of having this kind of a complicated system where we break the stimulus into features and then build them back up again? Well, one of the consequences is it, is it, it adds tremendous amount of flexibility to the system. So if I had a labeled line system, so a coffee receptor that tells me I just smelled coffee, uh, in the visual system, maybe I have a car receptor. So when I see this, this image, my visual system um, has a receptor that's only activated in response to that stimulus, and so now I can recognize that car. Okay. But if I see another car and other kinds of cars, if I'm working at the level of, level of labeled lines and I'm only recognizing this as a car, I'm going to have trouble dealing with these other kinds of, of cars. But if I have a system that breaks the object down into features, like it's got to have four wheels, maybe a windshield and, and, and some other windows and, and somebody wearing blue inside, uh, then, then I can break it into its features and say, okay, this represents car and, and it's similar to the template. This pattern is similar to the template uh, that, I've, that I've stored in my brain. It gives, again, tremendous flexibility uh, and, and it leads to the, to, the, to the fact that we have a really remarkable broad range of, of things that we can smell. Somebody can go over to, to Stewart's lab and, and mix some chemicals together and, and get in trouble and then some chemist could instead do that and create a molecule that you've never smelled before or a mixture you've never smelled before and you'd be able to, to learn that new combination and identify, oh, that's, that's Chanel number four. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's different from others. Um, it also allows for us to fine tune based on our experience. So we talked about wine, earlier speakers talked about wine experts and, 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 and uh, chefs, and so we can, we, can, we can learn to make some discriminations much more precisely um, uh, than others. In fact, that experience uh, can lead to, to both improvements in smell, so I can, I can learn that Initially, I just, I'm not very good with flowers and I smell flowers and I don't really tell the difference between these two aromas, but if it's important to me, if I have attention and I have those other sorts of hedonic things, maybe I'm a florist, I can learn that although these two patterns of odors are very similar, I should distinguish between them. 
And your brain, your olfactory system, can learn to separate patterns that are initially fairly um, difficult to discriminate. The, 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 the other side works as well, however. If, if I don't pay much attention to the differences between odors, if I really don't pay any attention to the difference between Starbucks coffee and the coffee that I just spent all that money on the water filtration system and the, and the high end and, and coffee, coffee machine, then I can actually lose the ability to distinguish between, between patterns. I, I, will, I will complete or, 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 or merge patterns together that really shouldn't be merged. So using your olfactory system, attending to odors, uh, making fine discriminations is, is, um, is probably a good thing. So two final points, and I think I'm going to be way on time. Uh, two final points that, that um, uh, have already been brought up that, but, uh, that I think are important in trying to understand olfaction is, is as we've already heard, uh, most of what I've just talked about and what, what many people primarily talk about in, in olfaction is this orthonasal olfaction. So I have something outside of my body and I inhale those volatile molecules. I activate my olfactory bulb and my olfactory cortex and some of these other circuits and I say that was, that was a rose or, or that was chocolate. We're not bad. Humans are not bad at this. So if you go into the lab and you look at thresholds and you look at ability to make sensory discriminations, we're really not bad compared to many other animals. We tend to think of ourselves as, as smelling bad, at least I do, uh, but, but, um, but in fact humans are, are not bad at that. But retronasal olfaction, as, as, as has already been brought up, we are awesome at retronasal olfaction. So as was already mentioned, now you take that thing from the outside, you put it into your mouth, you chew it, you release extra volatiles, and as you exhale now, rather than inhale, as you exhale, um, as, as you're chewing that, now, again, you're going to be activating your olfactory system, but you've also got, you've got temperature, you've got mouthfeel. Is it creamy or is it crunchy? Uh, you've got the taste, sweet, sour, salty, uh, et cetera. And so this, this representation uh, becomes this really phenomenally rich uh, thing. And, and again, w humans uh, are probably the top of the line when it comes to retronasal olfaction. So you can, you can go home and you can, you can give your, your pet you know, that really nice cut of meat, and it's almost certain they're not going to savor it. They, you know, it doesn't sort of languish on their tongue as they, as, you know, it's gone. But you, on the other hand, be, because their, their sense of, of, of retronasal olfaction is not that awesome, they've got it all figured out by, before it gets into the mouth, um, and now it's just going to go down. You can, you can savor that food, chew it up, really express some of those volatiles. And, and of course, cooking is another thing that helps um, express additional volatiles. Um, the, la <clears throat> the last thing that I'd, that I'd like to talk about is, is, is that identifying odors is, is difficult. So I'm showing you this image, and, and I'm guessing there's two to three million people in this room. Um, and, and most of you, 99% of you, are going to be able to say that's a banana. Okay, you see that visual stimulus. If, however, I had a, an unlabeled jar, clear glass, no label, um, it's got a clear liquid, and I say, hey, smell this. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 and I asked you all to do that, uh, I'd probably get at least a dozen different answers as to what it was. Okay, we, we, we are not really good at odor identification. If I labeled the jar, this is isoamyl acetate, and it really smells like banana, or if I told you, hey, smell this, it smells like banana, then we'd get convergence again, and 99% and, and of you would say, yeah, that totally smells like banana. This is a problem, um, and, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why clinical tests of olfaction and odor identification are multiple choice. So you, you give somebody an odor, and you can't just say, hey, what does this smell like? Because again, you'll get 20 different answers if you have, if you have 30 different people. And so a scratch and sniff olfactory test, uh, you have some options to choose from just to get some stability. Uh, uh, William James uh, 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 mentioned that, that expectation, it was, uh, expectation um, which could come in, in, in the form of somebody telling you what you're about to smell or labeling or colors uh, or other sort of contextual 
uh, information can really strongly influence what you, th what you say that you're smelling. And when, when he's saying taste here, again, as, as was mentioned before, he's talking about flavor as well. Um, so, so why is that? Um, why is it so difficult to, to identify uh, with a verbal label what, what the odors are? We don't really know uh, very well. There are some, there's some nice work now uh, looking at, at links between the olfactory system and, 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 and uh, language uh, circuits. But one of the things that we do know is that not only is odor identification hard, but it's also really vulnerable. Oh. And, and if you look at um, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, or, or even having some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, uh, you will have odor identification problems. And it can be selective to odor identification. You can do other sorts of verbal labeling things just fine, but you have trouble uh, identifying odors, and we really don't know uh, why that is. So we think the olfactory system uh, uh, breaks uh, the things that you inhale into, into features which are, which are expressed in uh, early stages of the olfactory system in a uh, spatial and, and temporal way. Then other parts of the system read those patterns and, and create, based on experience, create odor objects which have all sorts of consequences in terms of, of allowing a pattern recognition and rapid recognition of odors and, and incredible flexibility so you can smell lots of things. Uh, thank you.